Okay, well, mm, hopefully that gets sorted out, but welcome guys to our fourth official confirmation meeting in our first all online one. So fingers crossed that nothing completely goes wrong today, uh, but technology loves to do what it does. So to start out, we're gonna begin in prayer. So if you'll join me uh, and we can begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, let your presence be known. Father, we thank you for bringing us here today. We thank you for this gift of a new day, this gift of life that you continue to give us. Uh, we ask that you please continue to help all those who are on the front lines of this, uh, this COVID pandemic, that you please continue to help give them the strength and the courage and the knowledge necessary to help end this. Uh, that we might be able to come together in person once again. We ask this through the intercession of our blessed mothers. We pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So if you guys can't tell by what's on your screen, uh, we are going to be doing uh, the sacraments and specifically confirmation. So uh, there's a little bit of a reading down there, but that's just for you to reflect on. So don't worry. Uh, we're going to start out with a little video to begin with. Well, one of the great joys I have as a bishop is presiding at confirmations. And so I find myself right now as I record these words in the middle of confirmation season. Now, one of the drawbacks, though, is I have so many. I have about 40 in a very concentrated period that I get sick of my own homily. So I'm always kind of changing and adjusting and finding new angles. And, and there are actually a lot of interesting angles, I think, on the sacrament of confirmation. I want to share with you the most recent homily I've, I've been using for these, uh, these young people. I talk about the five promises. So just before the calling of the Holy Spirit and the anointing of the candidates, we have the reaffirmation of their baptismal promises. I tell the young people, you know, when you were babies, most of you, um, your parents and your, your godparents made these promises for you. But now you're going to stand up on your own two feet. And in your own voice, you're going to make these promises. And I mentioned to them how they're doing it in the midst of the church. So literally all these people watching and listening it's very important. They're publicly declaring who they are before the church and before God. So I'll just say one simple thing about each of these promises. This is what I'm, I'm sharing with these young people. The first promise they make is negative in form, but it's okay, I tell them, because if you, if you set your face, you're automatically setting your back, right? If you tell the world, here's what I'm for, ipso facto, you're telling them what you're against. So the first thing is they, you know, do you promise to renounce Satan and all his empty uh, works and all his works and empty promises. Well, I say to them, what are the empty promises that you're turning your back on? They're everywhere in the culture. You hear them in practically every movie uh, you watch, practically every song you listen to. They're on the lips of every pop star. Namely, you can be happy if you fill up your life with enough power and wealth and pleasure and honor, the big four, right? And again, start listening. Once you know those big four, start listening. You hear them every day. If you just get enough of this, you'll be happy. I tell the young people, and I say, older folks here know this. You have to maybe come to learn it. Wealth makes you wealthy. That's true. It does not make you happy. Power makes you powerful. It does not make you happy. Honor makes you honored, but it does not make you happy. And then I tell them, because every church you go into, there's some big depiction of the, of the crucifix. And I say, take a look up there. We don't put Bill Gates at the center of our attention in our churches. We don't put Donald Trump at the center of our attention. We don't put, you know, Beyonce or, or, or some pop star. We don't say wealth, power, honor make you happy. We put this weird image of a crucified Jesus who has eschewed wealth, pleasure, power, and honor. 
So I said, that's a symbol of this first negative promise that you make. Okay, that's what you're against. But what are you for? Well, now the remaining promises. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And I tell them what this means is not simply the intellectual conviction that there's a God. And that's countercultural enough today, God knows, with the number of you know, atheists and so on. But I said it means that you know your life is not about you. That a little baby, you know, his life is all about him. It's meeting his immediate needs, and that's okay. But then as we mature, I tell these young people, what happens is you're introduced to wider and wider horizons, right? Your obligation to your family and to your community and to your society and to your country. And then ultimately, if we're biblical people, our obligation to God. That you do not find your joy in the measure that you realize your projects and plans, but rather that you surrender to God's purposes and that you become an ingredient in God's purpose, then you find your joy. So I said, that's what you're saying when you get up and say, I believe in God. Next, that you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And here I say to them, look, just, just focus on that one word, Lord, Lord. Everyone's got a Lord, I tell them. And they, they might pretend, that, oh no, I'm just you know, self-motivated. No, no, everyone is beholden to somebody or something. It might be your country, your culture, it might be uh, some ideal, it might be your company, it might be money, it might be fame. But there's some Lord of everyone's life. And uh, even though the young people don't get this, I, I quote uh, my hero, the Nobel laureate Bob Dylan, that you know, you got to serve somebody. <laughs> it might be the devil, it might be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. Everyone's serving some Lord, right? Who's your Lord? You're going to stand up and say that Jesus is my Lord. Then I remind them, again, glancing up at the cross, what does it mean to say that Jesus is your Lord? It means no one else is Lord. And that means it's a permanently subversive and revolutionary claim. And then I remind them, the first Christians who made that claim, almost without exception, ended up in prison and put to death. So, you know, please God, they'll never come to that point. But I said, still, you're making just as radical, just as revolutionary a claim. Next, they say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. So I say to them, look, who's the Holy Spirit? And they're all wearing red. You know, usually I'm in a red vestment, unless it's on a Sunday. Um, so we're wearing the color of fire, the color of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, I tell them, is the love that connects the Father and the Son. So the Father and Son from all eternity look at each other and they breathe forth their mutual love. And that is the Spiritus Sanctus, the holy breath, right? The love that God is. You're against wealth, pleasure, honor, and power as the source of your happiness. What will make you happy, I tell them, the only thing that is correspondent to the infinity of your desire is the infinity of the divine love. The only thing that's inexhaustible is the divine love. And so what you're saying when you say, I believe in the Holy Spirit is, my life is not going to be an adventure in increasing my wealth and honor and power. My life will be an adventure in increasing my capacity for love. right? And that's all that finally matters, all that will finally make you happy, I tell them. Then, finally, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Now, I say, look, it might seem obvious. Here you are, you're all in church, and you're all getting confirmed as Catholics. But what does it mean to believe in the church? I remind them the church is not a club or a society, a voluntary organization which you can leave if you want to. You, know, you join the Abraham Lincoln Society or the Bob Dylan Club, and great, until they annoy you or do something you don't like, then you leave. It's a voluntary organization. But the church, and I then remind them of Paul, is not an organization but an organism. It's a living body, and they're the cells and molecules and organs in it. They're the means by which Jesus continues to do his work. So you might think you can just opt out. But in fact, you're permanently members of this mystical body. And um, if you opt out, the work of Jesus won't get done in the world. You know? 
So I want them to see the, the enormous obligation they have in saying, I believe in the Catholic Church. Just the last thought that I share with them, that they're going to come forward and I'm going to mark them right, with the chrism oil, to mark them with the cross of Jesus. And I remind them that, sa- that um, confirmation is a character sacrament. The life baptism and holy orders, it can't be given more than once because it conforms you it marks you in a permanent way, right? And I said the word character is from a Greek term that means brand. Like when someone brands the, the cattle and it claims the, the animal, it belongs to me. I said, I'm going to claim you with the cross of Jesus. I'm going to brand you. We're, you. You belong to Jesus now, you know? And that's what we're confirming you in is this new identity. As someone who's made these public promises against certain things and for other things, and now branded and confirmed, you're ready to go forth. Um, I hope they take it in as a, (laughs) not overwhelming message, but as a kind of a bracing, and I hope finally um, deeply encouraging message. Awesome. All right. That was Bishop Barron. He's a, he's a fantastic bishop that I love. Uh, he just, he has a way with words and a way of describing things that I love. And so I wanted to share that with you because um, what are we here for? We're here to learn about the sacraments, but specifically we're here to learn about being confirmed. And so I think the way that he describes confirmation and everything that goes into it, um, it got me excited. and I've already been confirmed. So uh, I hope that does at least something to inspire you and get you a little excited about what to look forward to. Uh, so like last time, we're going to do a recap of what we did in our last meeting. Um, our last meeting was about why believe in the church. So we talked about how the church is God's kingdom. So it's the final covenant he makes for his people, and it's his eternal salvation. Um, it's the last saving act that he does for us. Um, and it still continues to go on today. Uh, next is it's the bride of Christ. So just like in marriage where two different people become one and through the sacrament of marriage, uh, Jesus combines himself with his people so that they might become one um, in the church. And then finally, it's the mystical body of Christ. So kind of tied into that last point, um, we are unified with Christ. And so when Christ is resurrected, we are brought into heaven with him um, and we get to participate in his divine life. We also talked about how there are four marks of the church and how the Catholic church specifically uh, identifies each one uh, within itself. So there's one holy Catholic and apostolic. And we're gonna go a little bit more in depth with these in the coming sessions. Obviously, today is going to be about the sacraments, uh, but just a brief refresher. One is about community. So Jesus founded the one church so that we might all be united in him. He didn't want separation. He wanted one church. Next is holy, so the sacraments. Jesus continues to act through the church because he's not dead. Uh, He was resurrected and came back to life. And so he continues to work in the world through his church. Um, And he does this through the sacraments, which bring grace into the world. Next is Catholic, which means universal. Uh, We remember talking about this from St. Ignatius of Antioch, who first called the church Catholic um, back in the 300s. And that just means universal. So everyone is called and everyone is welcome to become sons and daughters of God, um, to participate in this life um, and to be one with God, how we were meant to be. Uh, And then finally, apostolic. So this is where the authority of the church comes from. So the Catholic Church is the only church that can say um, that it holds the traditions and teachings of Christ and his apostles um, and can trace all of its steps back to that founding moment. So that was all about why we should believe in the church. So what does the church really do? Uh, It does a lot of things, but specifically it does the sacraments. And the sacrament that we're all here for is for confirmation. So today we're going to go into what are the sacraments and specifically what is confirmation. 
Um, to begin with, we're going to go uh, with a little scripture reading. This is from the first chapter of Acts, and I will just go through this for you, but it's on the screen so you can read it along with me if you want to. So, in the first book, Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus did and taught until the day he was taken up after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them by many proofs after he had suffered, appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While meeting with them, he enjoined them to not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father about which you have heard me speak. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When they had gathered together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He answered them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has established by his own authority, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, through Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him from their sight. While they were looking intently at the sky as he was going, suddenly two men dressed in white garments stood beside them. They said to them, men of Galilee, why are you standing there looking at the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you to heaven will return in the same way as you have seen him going into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. So that is the first account of Jesus uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, where he is basically saying, all right, I'm going back to heaven. and One day I'll come back, but I I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send my spirit, the Father's advocate, um, to be with you and to baptize you. Uh, and so that is really at the heart of what confirmation is, is that fulfillment of what Jesus is saying to the apostles. But before we get into that, we should really talk about what is a sacrament in the first place. So like last time, we're going to go straight with the Oxford Dictionary definition. Always a good one. It's a noun, and it's a religious ceremony or, vert or ritual regarded as imparting divine grace. That doesn't really clarify things much, um, but it does give us a starting point. Uh, we can also recognize that sacrament comes from the initial Roman Latin word, uh, sacramentum. And this comes from the ancient Roman uh, tradition of soldiers and religious people would give an oath or a vow that was uh, given to the gods, in this case, God. Um, and would bring a, uh, a negative sense if it was violated. Uh, and then also it referred to a thing that was pledged as a sacred bond um, or consecrated to God. So the church, which started in Rome um, once it was legalized, it took a lot of the traditions that it found around it and brought it into itself because that's what the church does. It brings things into its fold. And so they use the term sacramentum as its own kind of the church's own version uh, of what the Romans were doing. And so it was something that was instituted by Christ. So something that God himself said, this is important. We're going to continue to do this. Um, but specifically, it was an outward sign of an inward grace. So what does this mean? Uh, this means that there's an outward sign. So this is like when you're in baptism, they baptize, so they pour water over the infant or the person. Um, and this shows us of a similar act acting at the, the exact same time, which is God imparting a grace. So through the, the priest saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and through uh, pouring the water upon the person, God, through that sacrament, imparts the grace of baptism and sends his gift of the Holy Spirit to that person and claims them for himself. And so there's three parts of a sacrament. There's the form. So that is uh, how the sacrament is performed. So this is the priest baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
Um, there's the matter. So what is being, or what is part of the, the sacrament itself? So in this case, it would be the holy water that's being baptized or being poured over the person. And then finally, a proper minister. So in this case would be a priest or a deacon, or in very, very special circumstances as well. Uh, you can also, any baptized person can do an emergency baptism if there's no other priest or deacon nearby. Um, but that doesn't, very, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, but it's cool to know that we can do that. So every sacrament has a form, a matter, and a minister. Uh, next, we find that there are seven identified within scripture. Uh, and these were selected by Jesus and his apostles to continue on the tradition. And that there's three types of these. Uh, there's the sacraments of initiation. There's the sacraments of healing. And then there's the sacraments of vocation. And each has a specific focus that we'll talk on in a little bit. Um, and then some are even so special, like uh, Bishop Barron said in the video, that they confer an indelible spiritual mark. So indelible just means it can't be removed or changed. Um, so this means that it is a character of grace given to a person as a sign of belonging to Christ. So that sacramentum, in a very real sense, when we're baptized, uh, we are forever changed by that receiving that sacrament. And we are given something that cannot be taken away from us. Um, that is a sign of us belonging to Christ. So when we die and we go to heaven or we are judged before God, uh, we will have that mark of baptism upon us. Uh, and God can see that we receive that gift. Um, so I think that's really cool. So obviously we talked about how there's seven sacraments. So we're just going to do a little brief explanation of what each of them is. Uh, there's first the sacraments of initiation. So these sacraments focus on uh, what brings a person into the church. So we have baptism. This is the first one that everyone receives. Um, and it cleanses original sin, but it also claims us for Christ and gives us uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Next is uh, the Eucharist, uh, which is something that we receive every Sunday, but it helps conform us into the body of Christ and brings us into union with Christ uh, through eating his body and drinking his blood. And then also confirmation is another initiation sacrament because it is a it's almost a completion of what happens at the beginning of baptism so in baptism we receive the holy spirit uh, and we are brought into uh, the church but in confirmation we take this on and say i choose this and i have i have uh received enough training and i have grown enough in my own faith to claim this as my own and that I will serve the church. So I confirm my baptism um, and the church confirms that baptism. Uh, and so it seals us with the Holy Spirit. And so we are given all the fullness that we need to uh, be real Catholics and be full Catholics. So confirmation is that completion of the baptism and Eucharist is that uh, continual sanctification, that continual giving of grace that we receive to continue to be made into the people that we're made to be. Uh, and so those are what the sacraments of initiation are. Uh, next are the sacraments of healing. So these we don't receive quite as often. Um, and they're, you, I guess you could call them optional, but they're not really optional because they're still really important, hence why they're sacraments. Um, but they're used for when we have uh, a hurt or a lack or a sickness that comes to us. Uh, the most common one that we think of is reconciliation or confession. Um, this is obviously when we have uh, either a major or a minor sin um, that happens in our lives that we commit. Uh, we take ownership of that and we say, God, I'm sorry for this because I know this hurts you and this hurts me and I don't want anything in this world that keeps me apart from you. And so we go to God uh, asking for forgiveness and asking for him to remove that sin from us so that we might be brought back uh, into union with him. And the sacrament of reconciliation is one of my favorite sacraments, so I could go on forever about the sacrament. But 
obviously today we're talking about all of these sacraments, so I can't spend all that time just gushing over the sacrament of reconciliation. I go once a week. The church recommends goes once a month or at least twice a year. Um, and I definitely recommend it because it makes you more humble. Uh, it helps you become a holier person. Um, and some of the saints went every day. So at the same, if it's good enough for the saints, it's good enough for us. Um, but also there's another sacrament of healing that's even less um, uh, given or uh, even less people do, um, which is the anointing of the sick. So this happens when somebody has a really um, difficult physical or spiritual or mental um, uh, sickness that, that befalls them, that uh, they ask the church to give them special healing for and to anoint them uh, with the holy oils um, to increase that grace um, and that trust in God uh, through this difficult sickness um, and ask God to heal them in a very, very specific uh, way. And I think this is a very not well-known sacrament, uh, but it's also one that's probably one of the most interesting. So I highly recommend that you look up into the anointing of the sick and what it does, because I think it's really cool. And then lastly are the sacraments of vocation. So these ones you probably, well, you know marriage the most, but these ones you know pretty well, because uh, these are the sacraments that help us to become the people that we are made to be. So our vocation is our calling in life. So who we are called to be, and we are either called to uh, be married or to become uh, consecrated to God, either through uh, a holy single life or uh, holy orders. And so marriage obviously is where the man and the woman come together and profess their love throughout the church um, and to God and ask God to um, guarantee, almost guarantee their marriage um, and to bring them into a fuller life so that they can love each other better um, and have a holy family. But holy orders is a little different because not everybody can receive holy orders. Only men can in the church. Um, and this also is another indelible mark because through holy orders, a, a priest is consecrated to the church in a, in a way that changes them forever. And what do we mean by this? Well, they become an, a more intense image of Christ upon the earth. And so they are specifically made and chosen by the church to be ministers of the church, to be little Christs almost, uh, and to be able to perform the sacraments and do the duties of the church uh, on her behalf. And so also deacons can receive holy orders and marriage so long as they received marriage first. Um, but once you receive holy orders, you cannot receive another uh, sacrament of vocation. So that's a one and done thing, hence why priests can't get married. Um, but deacons can be married. So these are a little overview of what the sacraments are. Uh, there's a lot of them, and we, we could have entire sessions over just specific ones, but we're here for the sacrament of confirmation. So what is confirmation? Um, like I said earlier, it's a completion of your baptism. So we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And we receive the fruits and the gifts of the Spirit in its fullness. So everything that was planted within us during baptism comes into um, its fullest form so that we can utilize all of it. Uh, and it also claims us for Christ. So that sacramentum, when the, pre, or when the, the bishop marks us with the holy order, uh, the holy oil, and marks us with the sign of the cross, we are forever claimed for Christ, and we've received that indelible mark. Um, so we are always going to be a child of God, no matter what we do or what anyone does to us, cannot take that, take that away from us. Um, it brings us closer to Christ, um, and it makes us fully Catholic. So we are able to participate in the divine life of the church uh, in a more fuller way. Uh, but the bat. Uh, but confirmation is not just about us and what happens to us. It's also a sacrament for the church. So the church welcomes her, her people uh, or her con the confirmants into a fuller life. 
And so both sides of the aisle make promises to each other. So the minister welcomes the conferments into the fullness of the church. Uh, through this, the church pledges, pledges to protect and minister to her people and to provide them with all the spiritual needs that they need. Um, while the conferments pledge to live an active life in the faith and in service to God and to serve her church. And so I think it's, we focus a lot during confirmation on what happens to us, obviously, because we want to know what the heck's going on. Um, but I think it's also important to realize what, what statement we're making through confirmation, because this is really the first time we get to take ownership of our faith and say, yeah, I was baptized. Um, my parents did that for me, and the church took me in through that. But now I get to decide this is my faith. This is how I'm going to live my faith. Um, and we choose both a sponsor and a patron saint to help guide us through this, uh, this journey of living a fuller life in the church um, because we recognize that we need other people to help us. Because even though we've claimed this faith as our own, um, we're still growing and we still have a journey to go on. Uh, I'm 23 and I know I have so much work to do still uh, in my faith life. And I can tell you people who are 70, 80, 90, they, they still tell me that they're still working on their faith. And so this confirmation is not a graduation, uh, but it's a claiming of oneself um, and their life for the church. And so there are a lot of people in the church who are uh, great models of the faith. And this is what we're called to do as confirmed Catholics. Uh, and so as um, the past few meetings we've had, we've had a witness. I wanted to have our very own Ken give a witness on what the sacraments really mean to him and specifically what, what a confirmed Catholic really looks like. So... I will stop sharing my screen and give it over to, uh, I'll give it over to Ken. There you go. Super, thank you. Can you hear me, Kyle? Okay. Um, hey, first of all, uh, for all of you who are in my small group, Eddie, Henry Davis, Ty, Aaron, Nathan, and Sydney, just think, Everybody else has to put up with what you, you've been putting up with now for, for several weeks. So that's awesome. You kind of get to share, you know, that, that, uh, that annoying guy uh, with all your friends here. So that's fantastic. Um, so, yeah, as Kyle mentioned, um, the sacraments are a huge part of being Catholic. Uh, really, for the most part, no other religion, no other religious group emphasizes the sacraments as much as we do, which either means that Catholics are just really weird or that we're on to something really, really, really important. And of course, I think it's the latter one there. So I wanna share a little bit, as Kyle said, about the role of the sacraments in my life. Um, so to start with, I would say that one of the things I love about the sacraments is they help me appreciate and experience God's presence and love with all of my senses. You know, God loves you so much, he knows that you're, you're not just a pair of ears. You know, hearing words is important, but God gave you five senses, right? We can see, we can, we can touch, we can taste, we can smell, and the senses really get our whole body involved. Um, that's how much God loves us. He wants to be present to us uh, in a way that kind of involves our whole person, okay? So as far as a few specific sacraments go, um, again, just, just to sort of share a little bit about their role in my life. Um, like Kyle, I love the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Um, and one thing, um, and, and if Kyle would have had more time, he probably would have said this. Uh, people think that the sacrament of reconciliation is what you do after you've committed one or more sins, and that's true. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the grace of the sacrament can actually help keep you from sinning as much in the first place. You know, there's an old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So one of the reasons people like to celebrate the sacrament of penance so frequently is, is that, and, and again, I'm talking about myself, uh, it, it, I still sin because uh, I struggle with sin just like, just like everyone, but I know the grace of the sacrament um, not only addresses sins that I've committed, but it helps keep me 
from falling even deeper into sin than I would without the sacrament. So I hope I hope that all of you come to make the sacrament of penance a real regular part of your of your faith and your life. Um, confirmation. Uh, being a confirmed Catholic, I I I know that confirmation helps me to be more aware of the Holy Spirit's presence in my life. Um, and the Holy Spirit wants to do a lot of things for us. Um, three big ones are the Holy Spirit wants to renew or refresh us. The Holy Spirit wants to guide our decisions. And the Holy Spirit wants to comfort us when we're struggling. Um, and again, uh, the grace of the sacrament of confirmation helps me be more aware of the Holy Spirit's presence in my life, of, of his ability to do those things for me, and of his desire to do those things for me. And, and, and guys, who doesn't need to be renewed or refreshed once in a while? Who doesn't need to be guided um, in our decisions? And who doesn't need to be comforted uh, once in a while because of life's struggles? So, so as a confirmed, you know, when you're a confirmed Catholic, I think you have an even greater ability uh, to sort of be open to the Holy Spirit and access those special graces. Um, let's talk about the Eucharist. Um, you know, I know that Jesus wants me to experience him um, in a in a way again that's that's not just hearing about him uh, but he wants me to to know his presence his real presence in my life and i, I tell you jesus is really smart you know you can never you can never outsmart jesus he he wanted to come up with a way to continue being present to every christian uh throughout throughout the world and throughout history until he comes again in glory so one of the most basic needs we have one of the most basic desires that we have is for food to eat, right? I can't go more than a few hours without eating, and I start to get hangry. Um, and so Jesus comes to us in the form of bread and wine. It's ingenious. Um, he loves us that much. He wants us to need him and want him that much, and he wants to be so close to us that he gives himself to us in the Eucharist. So, so you know, the Eucharist is a huge, a huge one. I mean, all the sacraments are important, but 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 the Eucharist is certainly the biggie. Um, and folks, that's why getting the mass is so important. Um, and again, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but but I certainly I certainly make mass a priority in my weekend. I do lots of things on the weekend, just like you, uh, like to have fun, get some things done, whatever. But but getting the mass so that I can experience uh, the presence of Jesus sacramentally in the Eucharist is huge. Um, moving toward wrapping up, um, I'm married. Uh, so, uh, as Kyle said, the, the, the grace of the sacrament of holy matrimony, I know at times gives, gives me the, 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 the strength that I need to, to make uh, my relationship with my wife as good as it needs to be. Um, so yeah, m most of you, God is calling most of you to holy matrimony. Um, and, and again, when you celebrate that as a sacrament, uh, you do receive special graces to help you as a couple throughout your married life. And you can sort of say the same thing about holy orders as well. When a, when a, when a deacon or priest or bishop is ordained, um, you know, there's grace there that sort of that helps him fulfill those promises he makes. So just to wrap up, just to kind of summarize, um, uh, again, uh, the, the sacraments mean a lot to me. They make me more aware of God's presence in my life and of his love for me. Um, because of the sacraments, um, uh, I, I should say, uh, the sacraments are very helpful to me, uh, partly because of the sacraments. I know I'm never alone. I never feel lonely and I never feel unloved. Okay. Um, because the sacraments make me more aware of God's presence and his love. So, so I appreciate the sacraments. I hope that you already appreciate the sacraments. Um, you just, you just heard a great talk about the sacraments that we're going to have some good discussion in our small groups. Um, and, and, and I pray that as you progress through life, that, that your appreciation of the sacraments grows more and more deep, all right? Um, and that's about all I have for my witness, Kyle. Hopefully, hopefully that'll, that'll do the trick. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, sacraments are just such a beautiful way uh, of showing God's love for us um, and his continual love for us because God didn't wanna leave us alone and he didn't wanna just have a one and done uh, meeting on the earth. He wanted to continue to grow with us because we're always growing and we're always journeying. So um, I think I have everybody in their breakout rooms. Uh, so fingers crossed it's going to work. Um, you guys are not officially going to start until four o'clock for your small group. So if you guys want to take a little 
break, um, but I'm gonna open up the small groups now and you should get a notification um, to join yours. Um, so once you hit four o'clock, you guys can go ahead, get started, um, and you will be receiving a email about uh, a meeting for Life Teen afterwards. Uh, I'd love to see if you guys can join. Uh, just to meet up, talk, see how you guys are doing during this time. Uh, but thank you guys for coming, and I hope you have great small groups. Uh, Lisa, I'm just combining two small groups because there weren't enough people. Uh, so that's why you have different people in your group. Okay, so the first one I was in great, great breakout one, and then yeah. I, went back, I was in three with Ken. So I'm supposed to be in three with Ken? Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Now, I don't know how to get back there. So, I, oh. so the thing popped up and I went there and I saw Ken. I came back to you, but I don't know how to go back to... Let's see. Um, I'm going to move you. Oh, wait, I see breakout rooms. Okay. okay. I found it. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thanks.